Hi guys, I'm Brad Montgomery and welcome to The Breakdown. And here we talk about science, psychology, and investing. Today we're gonna to talk about getting your yard ready for spring and summer, all the things that you're gonna to wanna to do. Before we get started, if you missed any of our episodes, you can always go to keyfoxtv.com forward slash the hyphen breakdown. Now let's break it down. And I'm here with Denise S. Rodriguez. She's with the Texas A&M Ag Extension Office for El Paso. And we're going to be talking about all the things that you can do to get your yard ready for spring and summer. I mean, spring and summer are kind of a big transitional deal here in the borderland. It's really interesting what we see. You know, a lot of people don't even realize we get cold. We see freezing temperatures. So we have to kind of prep for that. Certainly more than Phoenix does or Vegas does or even Tucson does. We get, we get regular freezes. Uh, yearly regular freezes but once we come out of that things start to change and we start to do a flip and we start to head in the other direction and so so let's go through some of the things that that we can do to kind of prepare our yards for one thing and this is one that i've always i was actually struggling with it this morning believe it or not our lawns okay and so i've got bermuda grass right and i used to think you know well, I want to, I want my grass to be green. So let me start watering it in March. Right. You know, and what I would end up doing is watering these weeds and I'd have these <laughs> beautiful, happy weeds coming up. They were so thankful. I was giving them all this water and the Bermuda grass was not doing anything. And it wouldn't really start doing anything until I guess really late April or May right. is when it would start or even mid, mid, sometime in April to May it would start to pop out. So what do you recommend and why is that? And then yeah. what do you recommend how to handle that? And when should you start actually watering it <laughs> so you're not just making the weeds happy? Well, absolutely. Well, thank you again. Thank you for having me back. I always enjoy our conversations that we have, and especially uh, during this time of the year where there's like it's a fun. renewal, right? People <laughs> yeah. have this surge to kind of go outside and check things out and, and plant something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, you're definitely on the right course with Bermuda grass. It's the, the best warm season turf grass that we could have here in El Paso. It's drought tolerant. It's salt tolerant. It, you know, can withstand traffic, pets and kids and all of that stuff. So, uh, I think great. about that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is a lot. But uh, what happens with Bermuda grass is that it's triggered by soil temperatures. So unless those soil temperatures actually reach 65 degrees Fahrenheit, then that's going to trigger those roots to start setting up those shoots. Okay. So that's why we may see that the warm temperatures in the air. Right, feel good to us. <laughs> they feel right. good to us, yeah. but that soil is still cold. Okay. So that's why you see that kind of delayed greening up, if you will. But not everybody has a soil probe, right, to test the temperature. There's right. no one's probably that interested in doing that right. to that extent uh, as well, too. So, yes, you're you're exactly right that all of those warm season grasses that start popping up, the crab grass, the dandelion, yes. they'll take over. Oh, they do. <laughs> it looks great from afar, right? right. <laughs> it's green. And then when you on that vine, that right. vine that flowers, the yeah. pink flowers. Yeah, from afar, and then like as you get closer, you're like, wait a minute, that's, right. not, that's not grass. <laughs> exactly. That's, yeah. So the best thing to do is when uh, those start popping up, you can remove those because you know you're not going to take care, not kind of damage any of your Bermuda grass, but you'll just take out those weeds directly. So with that, um, you want to go ahead and start watering your Bermuda grass uh, when you start seeing that active growth. So the important thing about that is that before you even turn on your irrigation system, you may want to make sure that you have it, do a little audit on there and just make sure that if you have a sprinkler system, there's no broken heads or any kind of geysers that are going to inadvertently go off. Right. Possibly the time that you're either asleep or waking up in the morning and you can't get out there to fix it, you want to make sure that that's taken care of. So do a nice test run on that. Yep. Make sure everybody's working accordingly. It's spraying where it needs to be. Sometimes you walk over them and those heads move. They do. Right? Yeah. And that's what actually, it's so funny you say that. And and I kind of learned that the hard way. Luckily, I, it didn't take me too long, but I had turned my sprinklers on. Right. And I didn't, I think I, for whatever reason, I, it was, I had them run early. Yeah. And I happened to be up one morning early and one of the heads was shooting in the complete wrong direction. And yeah, I was like, yeah. well, I'm glad I caught it when I did, but I wish that I would have caught it sooner. So yeah, for the test run, right, that's a good idea. Just make sure you're out there with it. Right. And we definitely want to make sure that we're in compliance and that we're doing our water conservation plan. That's right. You know, that's really important. Um, the El Paso Water Utilities also recommends that you water your plants. So give you three days a week, depending on the ending of your uh, address. 
uh, on there, but I will tell you a secret. You don't have to water all those three days to be able to have a successful lawn. As a matter of fact, what you really want to do is be able to reduce the frequency of that irrigation okay. and water what we call water deep. And what's really important is that that water needs to make contact with that plant and that soil to be able to percolate into the soil profile. Okay. Um, with El Paso, as you know, we either have high heat or high winds. Right. Right. So all of that water, plus we also have low humidity. Yeah. So in, essentially, if we have a fine mist of water coming on at small amounts, it could be very easily lost to the atmosphere and never even make contact with the soil, let alone those roots. Yeah. So we have to make sure that when we do water, we're going to water that deep and we're able to get that um, evapotranspiration, if you will, recovered from week to week. So, And I, I like that as well, because I've had um, my own experiences with that and it was one of the first times I planted something. I think a lot of people do this and don't realize it. Right. Um, I've actually, I saw someone actually doing it not that long ago. And then we talked about it a little bit. Mm -hmm. It really does need to soak in. So I had planted out a bed of plants and I actually had like a little divider and everything that I put in. And I had watered it and I thought everything was good. Well, I stood back and there was one of the plants that I wanted to move. I was like, oh, you know what? I just put them in the ground. You know, let me actually... It's not going to hurt at this point, you know. And so I went and I to go move that plant, and all that watering and that I that top kind of spraying that I had done, it literally had soaked in maybe an inch and a half, and the rest of the roots. And I was shocked. So I totally changed my watering like that day, from that point on. And look, I was happy that I had the little barriers for the bed because then I could just put the hose in there, mm -hmm. kind of run it out, let it fill up, and turn it off, and it would soak in. And then it was soaking in. But I had heard about people talk about, you know, deep watering, and but I'd never done it. And yeah, when you just kind of spray along the top, it doesn't really, it doesn't do all what you think it's doing. Right. You know, I think a lot of people don't realize that. Yeah, no, we're also so unique to the our rest of our friends and family across the state too. We have so many different types of soil in this area. You know, have along the riverbed, we have really heavy clay soil. That's true. And then like near the airport, far east side, you have like this really like deep, Sandy soils with a with a caliche yeah. uh, underpan on it. And then too. on the west side, some areas it's almost all caliche. Yeah, exactly. That's or non existent soil. It's all it's all rock. So, yeah. <laughs> so really asking people, that's what we do at the extension services, ask people what's your zip code. Right. And it's not so much to like pry into their own personal no, business. It's just that a soil has a lot to do with that infiltration sure. rate as well too. And you know that. Yep. You know, you can get a heavy downpour of rain during our monsoon season. And you can drive by East El Paso and it's like nothing happened because all that water just soaks so right in. Sure. In the valleys, you'll see that that water will pond over se several days sometimes. Yeah, it, yeah it's very so. true. Almost like clay, like especially parts of Donovan. Mm -hmm. Whereas, yeah, on the east side, it just it soaks it right up. Yeah. Nah, it's, incre it's incredible. I, I had talked to uh, Parks and Rec one time mm -hmm. and they were talking about, where you were talking about soil. They were saying one of the toughest places they have trying to get trees to survive is on the west side. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah, it could be it could be tricky. Right. When I lived on the west side, you know, you, you got your oleander, your Italian cypress, a lot of the Mediterranean stuff mm -hmm. can handle our heat and, and kind of poor soils. But um, if we have a super cold winter, you can have a few issues there. But so from watering to the lawn uh, to fertilizer, yeah. that's an important one. And we were talking before different fertilizers for different things. Right. Right. So. So what one are we looking for for the lawn? Okay. So the key thing for that, what you're looking for is going to be uh, on every fertilizer bag, you're going to see three numbers on the front. Blast it all over that. You want to look for that first number, that first combination of numbers is going to be a high number. That's okay. going to be nitrogen. Okay. 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 So it's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Okay. okay. So, and the reason why we want that high nitrogen is because we're going to grow grass for their blades. We're going to grow them to grow green. And that's what nitrogen is. You don't want it to flowering. Provide. We're not going to flower our, right. our Bermuda grass, right? Tassels. They don't, right? they don't want that. <laughs> right. So uh, you'll see that on the side of every bag um, on there. And you can look for things um, that are going to have a combination of slow release fertilizer, slow release nitrogen, and fast release. So what that means is that you want that nitrogen to be readily available for that grass to pick up and metabolize that and use it so you can get a green up quicker. Okay, nice. But then it has a blend of that slow release that means it's gonna start taking you several weeks after that to start breaking down that fertilizer. 
and you kind of see that with the different uh, pellet sizes of the fertilizer itself. Sometimes it's granule. Sometimes it looks like it's kind of covered in plastic Perceal. because it is. Yeah. And that plastic is going to degrade Slowly. over time. So that's what you're looking for. I would say the one thing that you want to stay away from are weed and feed products. Yeah. And that was actually very important. I'm glad you brought that up. You had talked about that before, and a lot of people don't realize the downside of weed and feed. Right. So, yeah. Right. Absolutely. So that. By using weed and feed products to keep people like me <laughs> busy in the community. Right. Because sometimes we think, oh, the best of everything, like this combo it all together yes. and throw it out there. But we can inadvertently kill some of our perennial plants, some of our trees or shrubs that are in close proximity to our lawn. And as you know, if we have a lawn at home, we just don't have a lawn. We have a combination of plants, right? Vegetables and trees. And if that actually weed and feed product gets trickled into that flower bed or taken away with that water flow right, downstream. Down. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're going to have an issue on that. We see that a lot, especially with mature trees, uh, ash trees or mulberry trees. You start seeing, oh, there's herbicide damage on there. Oh, wow. And they think, oh, I didn't spray anything. Well, what did you put on your lawn? Because all of those roots are, they're all interconnected underneath that soil surface. Yeah. And it, it's, I'm so glad you said that. I remember there was a time where I would just take the thing and fill it up with weed and feed and just start tossing it everywhere and yeah. paid no attention. And I never even thought about it. Right. You know, never thought about tree damage or, or worse. Yep. So, yeah, that's interesting. So from lawns, let's let's talk about tree care because okay. we've got trees that are let, let's talk about kind of two kinds because obviously we've got we've got the evergreens here, mm -hmm. the junipers, even some of the broadleafs like the Indian hawthorn we were just talking about earlier. Uh and then also we've got the trees that come out of dormancy, you know, right. that, that are that have been I guess everything comes out of dormancy, but the ones that have lost their leaves. Mm -hmm. And that are deciduous and they're growing back so for the evergreen your evergreen shrubs mm -hmm. how do you want to move from what winter watering and what would that look like through spring into summer watering right absolutely so whether they drop their leaves or not there's going to be active amounts of growth happening in there it may not be as striking or as visible to us when you see a brand new leaf pop up but those conifers are doing the same thing. Okay. Uh, so you want to make sure that what you do is you go out there and check to see what kind of soil uh, moisture you have to start off with. Okay. And it's really easy to be able to get either a soil probe. Sometimes you use an old um, like screwdriver, one of those inexpensive screwdrivers that you can find, to kind of probe around in the soil to see really how wet it is under, underneath the soil. Because the key with trees is to be able to essentially flood them. <laughs> do they need like... Okay, the, okay. Do they yeah. need like moisture all the time kind of a thing? Yes. So in it so when you flood them, you kind of give them that, right? You kind of give them that. Okay. So we really never recommend for you to stop watering completely oh. during the winter. Now, that may do. not be practical for most people, right? Because yeah. we always want to be like we're always like protect the pipes, protect the people, you know, and all that. Yeah. So we understand that. Um, but it it's in good common good sense to be able to water. Some, that's not going to be the case for the majority of folks. So essentially what you want to do is you want to give them a, when you start seeing that active growth, just give them some great water to be able to get in there. Now you're talking about adding like one to three inches of soil, just, uh, sorry, excuse me, one to three inches of water okay. on there at one time. Wow. Because you want to make sure that those three inches are going to go all the way down into that soil profile. Like way down. Way yeah. down, okay. right? So um, that's where you have to do that. Now, one of the other limitations, right? Because we could talk about theory, we could talk about best management practices, right. but then we also have to be realistic to what homeowners have, right? right. And the, the the constraints with that. Most people will water their backyard based on the needs of the turf on the on the lawn, uh, and kind of the trees are kind of like an afterthought. Right. It's like, well, the sprinklers go on, and I water the grass, but that's not the same kind of watering. But it's not the same amount for that tree, yep. so. We gotta pull out our watering hose and take it directly to the tree itself. Now, we also have to remember that placement of that water is really important. So we don't necessarily have to water up against the trunk okay. of the tree okay. because those roots that are there are really there to add support and structure to keep that tree upright. Okay. So if you look at the canopy of the tree itself, it extends quite a far up from that trunk. Yeah, it does, yeah. Think of there's um, small roots that are at that same length. Oh, is that how far? Okay. They are. So it's called the drip line. 
And those are really tiny, small roots. And what they're able to do is pick up that water, pick up those nutrients on there. So when you water, you want to water along that drip line. So, you know, yeah, like out tree. from the trunk. You yeah. don't want to water the trunk. I see people do that. See, I've, I've done that. Yeah. I always thought you know, I've washed the trunk and I'm watering the trunk. And right, right. So, but, Which yeah. is great. But those little feeder roots on the end are really are really the ones that are going to be essential to pick up those wa- that water and that nutri- those nutrients okay. up there. So kind of it's going to be a wide area, which is why one of the reasons that we do recommend is when you purchase a tree and plant a tree in your backyard or front yard, you want to make sure you plant that for its mature size. Right, because yes. you want to make sure that you have enough yes. space to yep. be able to say, it's not going to dwarf your house, it's not going to cause damage to your house, but also you want to allow for that area to expand with those roots. Uh, that's true too. That's, that's why true. those roots that are way over here may be encroaching your Bermuda grass lawn. They're maybe They're susceptible. To get that water. Exactly. Oh. So everybody's fighting for these resources, yeah. and there's just not enough resources to happen. That's, so okay, that's mm-hmm. interesting. And, so, yeah, don't water your trees as often as your is your turf grass. You can go ahead and go like ten days with them, but just make sure that you do give them a good big drink of water. Okay, so keep yeah. watering mm-hmm. about every ten days or so. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And does that change in the winter? I mean, I guess I guess they. I mean, like you said, they're still not as actively growing, but there's. I mean, there still could be root growth. There still could be so so every ten days in the winter, or you know maybe. I would say 10 days now during the spring and going into the summer, all of the growing season. Okay. And then you can pull it back to once a month during okay. the winter time. Okay. Yes. Nice. If if the time, if it allows, right? right. I mean. Yeah. yeah. If we have a stretch of like 83 days. You know, maybe, right. Maybe, exactly. You know. Exactly. But, go, go and wrap that garden hose in your backyard. Yeah. <laughs> That's so, I've had actually had to do that a couple of times where, but I didn't, I ended up just getting a bucket. I'm like, I'm oh, not going to yeah. wrap the hose. Right. But, <laughs> but it's tempting because every now and then we do run into that here. Yeah. It's like, when do we unwrap the hose? Because we're still not done with freezes. Right. right. But we're starting to warm up. <laughs> Things are like wanting some water. So I've always said that the plants that never lie are going to be our mesquites. So when the mesquite breaks, but and you see those naturalized areas all around yeah, the city. Beautiful, like fluorescent green. Yeah, yeah, like lime green. Lime green. Those guys will never lie. You know that once those guys leave out, we shouldn't have it. We're, we're yeah. good. <laughs> Sounds good. It's all right. And okay, so we talked about lawn. We talked about trees. Um, now, as far as best watering practices, summer on into the fall, our summers have been, war- well, our warm season temperatures have been running longer right. into the fall. Is there anything that like you want to do in the fall to kind of prep your plants for winter cold? And it w- w- and I ask because what what I've noticed with our bigger freezes, mm-hmm. and I've seen people debate this online actually. And it was really interesting just to see, you know, sometimes they say time tells all, you know, because over the time of your life, you get more and more understanding things. And, and I remember this big debate online was, well, if you if you underwater, like your palm trees and your oleander or whatever, mm-hmm. through the wintertime, well, then there's less water in those cells to freeze. So if you have a bad freeze, they'll, they'll be less damage, right? right? But when you have, I actually saw the opposite, I think because... The plant is already in a weakened state. Mm-hmm. It's not as healthy as it could be. So then when you have this freeze, now it's it's actually more damaged than, than you know, I mean, then most people, I don't know if a lot of people out there, they've been up through to Las Cruces. Right. You know, when you exit university, you've got the, the, that hotel there that's got all those palm trees and all this irrigation and it's green. Mm-hmm. It seems like almost all the time. I don't know how they do it, but like almost all their palms survived when we had the big freeze in 2011 and they were minus five up there compared to the one to minus one down here. So it seems like irrigation, you know, withholding the water during the winter time to try to protect them doesn't really do that. It, it actually maybe has the opposite effect. You may put them in a weaker state so right. that they can't <laughs> bite off an occasional winter blast. Yeah, absolutely. So without getting like to plant nerd on you, yeah. <laughs> but really what that water in those cells do is they keep that cell turgid. Okay. So they keep it nice uh, and firm and to be able to keep it from collapsing. Got it. Okay. So that's the whole reason why you want to have a well-watered plant year round because you don't want it to be susceptible to that outside environment that it's dealing with. So that that is true. You want to make sure that they're well-watered. 
on there. People don't. So that's see. the see, battle that's, settle. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so that's, that, cool. that's, that's, cool. that's yeah, absolutely. So yeah, you never want to withhold anything. Um, essentially what you're doing is you have, your plans are in a constant state of stress. We have seen that all along, right? Like people do their best land managers or, you know, the street trees or the landscape trees. And if they're underwater, like you start seeing that die back, you start seeing those tips of those branches just either fall off or they're dead or they're dying or Yellow. you know or then you have insect issues like which is going to be the our biggest thing going into the summertime as well too so if they're in a constant state of stress they're more prone to insect infestations and then ultimately decline and then death so and then it's one thing that that i you know just things kind of pop up and this is what i like about these yeah. conversations so you mentioned insects and pests and i'm sure we'll talk more about them in the future um I did notice, and and, and I want to, you know, as we work away into the warmer season and things do start to get more active, that's when obviously disease and pests, you know, really start to become, come out again as well. It was either last year, it was either within the last year or three years, there was some kind of blight that was going around and just taking out a leander. And I guess I've seen it maybe even years prior where it had been really bad, where people were losing if they had three oleanders, sometimes they I saw where they lost half of one, or sometimes they lost two of the three. Yeah. I mean, what what are you supposed to do if you literally see like, and it's really bizarre, but right. you know the homeowners have, that have experienced this, you know, you're watering, you're doing everything right, your plant's healthy, and then all of a sudden, half of it, the leaves start to lose their color and start to wilt. Like. What are you supposed to do? So you have to be an investigator, okay. if you will. So most people, maybe you and I, are going to look up at the trees, right, as we're yeah. walking. But not everybody's noticing that at one time. They will notice when that becomes, that branch becomes too late. Too late. Right. <laughs> right. So just be an observer of your surroundings. Um, take your time and really look to see if you see any kind of insect damage, any kind of insect uh, remains sometimes, or even other pests uh, that are around as well to be able to see exactly what is happening. A lot of times there's a there's a threshold that the plant can kind of overcome and kind of withstand mm -hmm. any kind of pest pressure, but you never want to let that get too extreme. In the case of oleanders, um, we see a lot of the dwarf oleanders mm -hmm. are coal susceptible are, as yeah. opposed to the standard ones. Mm -hmm. So you see all of that tip kind of die back yeah. on there. Um, and that's a really great uh, opportunity for us as we're in the spring too is like, well, when do you remove all of that? Yeah, and, that, and also too, so, okay, so for pest damage and for like freeze damage, when do you want to eat like the palm fronds? Because some right. still have a little green and they use half of that, you know, fan to grow. Yeah, you know, absolutely. If it's a feather leaf, you know. Right. So when do you want to like, you yeah, know, but, yeah, 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 without hindering it, you know, versus getting that look that you want, that kind of tropical-esque. Right. You know, when when is when do you deem a branch time to go? Right. Okay. You know? All right. So I know it's really like difficult because we have some gardeners that live in the area of really tidy gardeners, right? Right. Everything's clean. Yes. Everything's like perfect. Nice. Right. <laughs> yeah. And then we have the other like more naturalized areas. Like, right. We're gonna leave that leaf litter, we're gonna leave those branches there for maybe the pollinators to okay. overwinter, things like that, right? So let them grow to seed. Yeah, yeah, exactly, that type of thing. So the number one thing is always when uh, you wanna remove things when they become a danger to people, okay. to pets, or to your property. Okay. okay, so that's gonna be your first thing, right? So your pond, level one. Level <laughs> one, right? So you don't wanna have those pond fronds to be palm fronds to be a fire hazard, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they're going to sit there, but they're going to get drier and drier. And then we're going to have you know, lightning or, light or fireworks, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. all those things are an issue. So you want to make sure that you remove it before that becomes an issue for that. Yeah. For your shrubbery, for your low growing plants that you kind of like are near your patio, I would remove all of the dieback, if you will, uh, when you start seeing active growth. So like um, like your lantanas, for example, they're a really common shrubs. Sometimes they'll die back depending on the winter that we have. Mm -hmm. When they start sprouting out from that crown or from that base of that soil area, then you can go ahead and trim off uh, the, that. Like head. the bird of paradise. Bush and the bird of paradise. Yeah, yeah bird of paradise is a great example. This year they didn't even really 
Yeah. Some of them. They just sat there. Yeah, they're going to get really big by right. the time <laughs> August comes around, especially yeah. if we get some rain this year. Yes, absolutely. Well, it was great. And we're going to have more conversations, obviously, as we go forward on plants and all the stuff that we need to know. Thank you very much, Denise S. Rodriguez. Where can people go to find out information on their own? Obviously, you guys have tons of information. Sure, absolutely. So you can go to our Master Gardener, a volunteer base, to answer all of our homeowner questions at txmg.org slash El Paso. And that page is maintained by our Master Gardener volunteers. <laughs> and all of the articles there are curated from all extension publications, but specifically for El Paso. Nice. All right. I'm going to check it out myself. Thank you again. Wonderful. Thank you for having me. If you enjoyed this conversation, make sure to comment, subscribe, and share it with your friends. You can check out our past archive of episodes on kfoxtv.com or listen on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much for breaking it down with me, and we'll see you next time here on The Breakdown.